Good evening, everyone. I am Aparna from the team of the Nature Sci, and I welcome you all to the webinar on Cherub of the Mist, the Red Panda. The Nature Sci, powered by Wildlife Arc, is a group of nature enthusiasts who wish to share their knowledge and experience with the world. They strive to bring informative and educational content from the tiny living world to the city dwellers. Their motto is to empower environmentalists by creating opportunities not only for budding environmentalists but also for people related to this field and also the ones who want to join in through their various offline and online programs. The Nature Sci works on bridging ecology and economy. We highly appreciate working with the nature enthusiasts and ecologists who wish to bring change by spreading education and awareness. Today's session is one such attempt and we have a number of such events in the line as well. Now coming towards our event today, uh, we will be talking about the red panda, their ecology and distribution, and the conservation efforts being made towards them. For this, we have here with us uh, our speaker, Ms. Pooja Kumari. Ms. Pooja belongs to district Aligarh of Uttar Pradesh. She has a master's in wildlife science from Aligarh Muslim University. She joined the Wildlife Institute of India in 2022 as a project associate in the Integrated Development of Wildlife Habitats, Red Panda Project, and has been working in the North Bengal landscape of Eastern Himalaya since then. At present, she is enrolled as a PhD scholar at the Wildlife Institute of India and has been working on the ecological and conservation aspects of red pandas. Uh, it's an honor to have you here with us, ma'am. Before I hand over the session to our speaker, I request all the participants to keep themselves muted when you're not speaking directly so as to not create any background disturbance during the session. And if you have any questions, we encourage that you unmute yourself and ask directly or you can type it out in the chat box and we will take up all the questions by the end of the session. Thank you once again and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Aparna, for the introduction. So we'll be begin. Yes, please. Okay, let me share my screen. Yes. Is it visible, Apanna? Yes, ma'am, it is. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My, as the introduction has been given, my name is Pooja Kumari. I'm a PhD scholar for the first year already from Wildlife Institute of India. So I started working for the IDWH Red Panda project in 2022, actually. Uh, and so we'll talk about this very beautiful, highly elusive and the charismatic species in a further session. So let's get started. So as you all know, today we are here to talk about this beautiful species, the red panda, on the very International Day of the Red Panda, 2023. So the International uh, Day of Red Panda was started in 2010 by Red Panda Network, which we'll further discuss throughout the session, its ecology and various conservation approaches. And uh, if I talk about the personal experiences of this species, especially the red panda, when I first saw um, in the field, I kind of like not uh, tell you about the experience and words. It was highly a uh, very big moment for me. And I felt like uh, crying for the very first time because we have been waiting for the species to show itself for the very, in last four months in the field. But then when we saw it, it was worth the wait. So let's begin with it. The Red Panda Network started uh, uh, Red Panda Day. Uh, International Red Panda Day in 2010 with a theme uh, to spread awareness regarding this endangered or another species that is near to the extinction. So with this theme, we'll move forward today and we'll try to understand the ecology of the species. The Red Panda. It is a highly charismatic species which uh, was first described in 1824. So you can... Uh, like uh, approximately calculate, it's been uh, around 200 years by now since the description of the species. It was introduced by Frederick Cuvier and the sample for the introduction was basically was itself taken from the northern uh, side of the country itself. It is the sole representative of the Elluridae family. If we talk about the morphological characters of the species, it is basically a very beautiful 
species that is belonging uh, to the uh, if we talk about body mass and dimensions its weight, weight varies from in males it is around 3.7 to 6.2 .2 kg whereas in females its weight varies from 4.2 to 6 kg if we talk about the head to body length of the red panda adult red panda it is around 560 to 625 millimeter and the length of the tail is around 372 to 472 millimeter so the further talk going on, if we talk about the scientific name of the red panda, that is Elorus fulgens. If we do say that on what basis the name was given to the species, it was like Elorus, Elorus basically means resemblance to the cat. So when the description of the species was given, they thought it resembles to the cat. And fulgens itself means striking colors. So a species that is resembling to cat with the striking colors was named as Elorus fulgens. In 1933, in 1938, till 1938, the, by Ellen, they have described two subspecies of red panda. First is Elaris fulgens fulgens and second Elaris fulgens tiny. That uh, tiny sample was taken basically from China. So till in 1938, there were two subspecies. But then a study was uh, carried out by who at all in 2020. They proved that these two subspecies are basically two different distinct species and these distinct species are Himalayan red panda and uh, Chinese red panda. If we say about what are the like morphological features on which they vary the Himalayan red panda and Chinese red panda. So we can say the Himalayan red panda is smaller in size and also the fur of the species is quite pale and deep reddish uh, white. Whereas in Chinese red panda, their pelage is darker to maroon, from dark red to maroon. And its face is also dark red. And uh, the stripe that is that goes from eye to mouth is also thick in comparison to the Himalayan red panda. So if we talk about the distribution range and what is the, like, the current status of the species, so endemically, this uh, species varies, uh, is distributed to the temperate and subalpine forest of Himalayas. And uh, it uh, goes into the Hangdu and mount mountain camp complex of China. And if we talk about the uh, ranging countries through which this habitat uh, passes, uh, are five countries, Nepal, India, Bhutan, and northern Myanmar. And then it extends through Hangdu and mountains in China. There have been various studies which show different, uh, like Anirudh Chaudhary studies from, they have shown the altitude from which the habitat or the red panda species is found from 1500 to 4800 millimeter above sea level. But then when we focus on today's studies, what altitude or what variation we took to take our studies forward is uh, by Roberts and Gilkelman. They have uh, given, they showed that uh, the altitude through which red panda habitat varies 2300 to 4000 millimeter above sea level. So because there was this very genuine debate on this because above 4325 meter is a notary line. So when this is an arboreal species, how can this can be found above tree line? But still there have been certain um, samples, that sample of red panda that has been found in China also. But then it was supposed to be taken as if the species was being taken away to that area, but it was not natively found there. So the debate carry was in. But uh, sensibly, this is 2300 to 4000 meter above sea level is being taken as a standard criteria to see the altitude of the species in today's habitat. The species is being uh, characterized or categorized as an endangered species in IUCN red list by, from 2015. If we see the earlier criteria of IUCN red list till 2010, the species was vulnerable. But then we can see the population decreasing trend of the species, which took it uh, to the 40% decline in the population till 2015, and the species was being categorized as endangered. It is scheduled one species from Wildlife Protection Act. That means the hunting, poaching, killing. And every offensive uh, act is be, is a punishable offense uh, for the species. It is included as a site, append, uh, a site has included the species in Appendix 1. 
if we talk about the current population trend of the species only 3 to 5000 individuals are left in a country and uh, this shows a high uh, decreasing population trend of the this very charismatic and elusive species in india and also globally also so if we talk about the range countries so and uh, the occurrence of the red panda in the range countries uh, first if we talk about india uh, it is found in majorly three states sikkim the northern part of the west bengal and uh, arunachal pradesh if we talk about the further presence of red panda throughout this these three states it is found in all four districts of sikkim whereas only in two districts of uh, west bengal which are darjeeling and kalimpong and 14 districts of arunachal pradesh the iuc uh, iucn data for india in arunachal pradesh still shows 11 districts but uh, through our literature surveys and going through the data we have finalized that 14 districts have been noted down in arunachal pradesh for the occurrence of red panda species so through other countries variation if we say in nepal uh, bhutan china and myanmar in nepal 14 districts of nepal and more districts have been predicted to have a potential habitat but then the um, other than 12 12 24 uh, districts the other 12 more districts are being still under process and uh, there have been a rigorous work that has to be done in that those areas to have a confirmation uh, regarding the presence of red panda in bhutan if we say there are 13 districts that have confirmed presence of red panda where the, the five more districts to have a survey to confirm the presence because uh, those five districts have the availability of the habitat uh, as uh, they go through the habitat analysis for the species to found and in china the provinces of sichuan yunnan tibet and gansu they have retained the confirmed red panda habitat presence with 58 counties within them if we talk about the myanmar the northern part of myanmar have the confirmed presence of the red panda but still in these uh, five countries we see the presence of the species but in in terms of population size it's still decreasing so if we talk about the evolutionary significance of the species it is uh, till uh, as i told earlier the species were described in 1824 but then till 20s mid 20s the species was put and placed under the family procyonidae due to its close resemblance to raccoons the people or the scientists those who were working earlier on the species the as there was data deficient and uh, they thought it resembled to raccoons so they uh, put it under the procyonidae family that is of that belongs to raccoons but then in 1921 there was a scientist pocock who suggested a separate family uh, for red panda saying that they do not resemble they they just look alike raccoons but they have a proper uh, different uh, phylogeny from the animal so the, a separate family was suggested named elyoridae if also if we say the evolutionary what is the evolutionary significance of the species not only belong if this is the sole member of the elyoridae family it's adapt being a carnivore its adaptation to an entirely bamboo diet and uh, herbivorous uh, herbivorous adaptation it makes it a specialist species in its dietary pattern and also the as i said it's lack di- it lacks the direct links to its lineage to other small carnivores which are which have not mod- modified as a herbivorous diet which are still carnivores but this has been so moving on to the ecological aspects of red panda first we will talk about the habitat ecology so the habitat ecology if we say it have inhabits a ran- range of montane temperate forest montane temperate forest we can say like mixed broadleaf coniferous forest uh, subalpine forest and coniferous forest with more studies suggesting preference to coniferous forest and also from a personal experience i would say they do suggest because then i got the sighting in the same area itself and uh, they on uh, not only the forest they must have the abundant bamboo under story because they directly rely for their feeding on that uh, with the constant necessity being there if we talk about the other micro habitat features which red panda depend on that is slow aspect and uh, presence of water source within 100 to 200 meters 
if we say about the slope they are generally uh, if we if we have gone through the literature and generally seen that they are found below 40% of the slope and the other aspects like fallen logs and tree stumps if we say they are being they are the other microhabitat features which are being basically used as rest sites or nesting grounds and especially in the season of breeding season these uh, uh, species when they are lactating or they taking care of the newborn they basically rely on the fallen logs and tree stumps or the large hollow trees with the bark so that they can uh, protect their uh, newborn from the predation if we if i say in north bengal landscape where i have worked uh, they have a majorly single inner national park and neeravalli national park if we talk about the habitat range in, within the national two national parks they have they vary from 200 uh, 2400 to 3600 meter in singalila national park and in neera valley national park if i say it varies from 2100 to 3140 meter for feeding strategies if we say the unlike typical carnivores they have uh, the carnivorous diet red panda has a simple short gut that is devoid of microbes and these microbes which are capable of digesting cellulose but it has modification in a dentition and skull structure that resembles those of herbivores enabling it to subsist on the herbivorous diet most by most of the diet like around 90% or 90 to 95% of the bamboo diet of red panda constitute of bamboo feeding but then if we say the dietary pattern of this species is very seasonal seasonally they uh, constitute basically bamboo feeding but bam to keep up its nutritional requirement also the amount of consumption of bamboo leaves changes seasonally with certain supplement of bamboo shoots uh, according to season fruits mushroom lichens and mosses and they sometimes also feed on the snakes uh, insects or small eggs specifically during the lactating period females leaf intake increases considerably than other seasons and uh, with extensive mastication or the chewing uh, with extensive chewing of leaves to digest the crude protein where, that is present in the leaves because the lactating period of uh, the red panda that is basically after the monsoon and when the young bamboo shoots they arise after the monsoon they have a high amount of crude protein in them so the red panda basically uh, do an extensive mastication that is extension chewing so as to digest that crude protein in singalila national park when uh, dr sunita pradhan in 2001 carried out a study they basically found the major uh, dietary uh, constituent of red panda was the bamboo two bamboo species species the first is arundinaria maling and uh, arundinaria aristata this they finalized as a pre monsoon and winter diet of the red panda species and uh, in monsoon and post monsoon they saw that the supplement the their diet was supplemented with the other certain species that was rosa saricara and the berries of sorbus cuspidata and other other uh, fruits talking about the breeding biology of this elusive species red panda reaches uh, to the sexual maturity by the age of 18 to 20 months and this begins with the easter cycle in females uh, and uh, which induces the sexual desire in them and this can be seen with the increase in the scent markings and uh, the other sexual <laughs> desire indications in the females the breeding season basically uh, starts with from january to march and uh, they have a gestation period of around 111 to 145 days that is um, the uh, like uh, with that the parturition period is around june to august in june to august the that is a period of uh, monsoon uh, in the habitat and there is due to the presence of monsoon in the area there is high availability of the forage during the pasturation period and the caretaking period of the newborns so roberts and kessler in 1979 found that the uh, little size of uh, red panda can reach up to 4 uh, cubs but then uh, due to the mortality of the uh, fetus 
uh, or uh, in certain cases, uh, the newborns were being predated very soon. The 90% of the letters were only for one to two cups. Talking about the activity pattern of this very well and uh, very beautiful uh, uh, mammal, the red pandas are active for 37 to 56% of their day in 24 hours. They are respectular in nature, but uh, when I say they are 37 to 56% active for the day, they are active with many rest periods. They can be about two hours within the two to two hours are uh, interspread in 24 hours. The, uh, if we say see, uh, according to season or seasonally, they are more active during the day in summer and autumn than in, the, in winter. In winter, they have low circadian activity because in winter, low, with high frequency of low rest, they uh, show or more than two hours of rest, they show a low circadian activity. This is a, as an adaptation to avoid the heat loss in the cold condition in the winter season and red pandas are inclined to rest often in clear skies than overcast winter and this supports the idea that they offer uh, they offset peripheral uh, cooling at rest by passive heat absorption and from direct insulation and uh, from their ventral which is why their fur around the limbs as well black coloration so the idea behind the black coloration to the ventral portion and uh, proves this thing that they are inclined to rest often in clear winter skies. If I talk now from the insights of my experiences from the field in North Bengal landscape, so we basically uh, uh, surveyed the area according to the literature given, we class classified the area on the basis of the altitude or the habitat availability in the 2300 to 4,000 meter above sea level of the habitat. And through this, the habitat was characterized to survey and various uh, protected sites were characterized in that uh, both the protected areas and the area outside the protected areas was taken. So we began our study with the habitat like this. If I talk about the insights or uh, the further methodologies we have used so far as uh, camera trapping so as to capture the data in the North Bengal landscape of this elusive species. But being a arboreal species, it becomes quite challenging to capture the species and uh, camera trapping. So we also, for to a uh, primary phase, we also gain some uh, key, uh, and we carried out key informant surveys around uh, the areas, uh, which uh, around the villages, which were near to the uh, habitat areas or the survey areas. So what we first do, we carried out the key informant surveys and took the prime information from the villages, talked to the people, because for any conservation approach, the community involvement is very much needed. Because till the time you won't involve the community for the conservation or the protection of certain species and make them understand how this is also useful for them also and the biodiversity also. So. Even though people, when we go, they show a very positive uh, attitude. They do welcome us with warm, warmly, very warmly. And uh, then we took out information regarding that panda presence and what is their perception towards the conservation of the species. And if they have seen in what area those people who, basic, people who basically, in this or forest specifically, when they are allowed to go carry out certain human activities, and have they got the sighting? What are the presence areas in the certain area? So we took out the information from the key informant service through that. Then on the, that basis and on our methodology basis, we carried out science survey in the area. And uh, for science survey, as we know, the species is arboreal. The science, we basically found the scat samples on the branches of the trees. So that was also a quite challenging task, but still the science surveys uh, we carried out, we got the positive samples also from certain areas and certain areas where we hadn't got any sample. And uh, also the camera tab data for in, for, from certain areas hasn't showed any positive results so far. And we are still working with that approach, positive approach to carry our work forward. And from the areas from which we have got the samples, 
they, they were collected for the genetic analysis and to bring to our laboratory at the headquarters of WIA. Now, if we talk about the threats or what are the conservation challenges to the species and the habitat range or in the ranging countries, through our literature survey or a literature review, we have depicted that through uh, the graphical representation. So the species is majorly susceptible to various threats that can be habitat fragmentation, anthropogenic activities, climate change. So we'll further one by one take all the threats and uh, here we'll see the direct impacts of human activities and the habitat. If we see the human activities, there are certain human activities which are being classified in terms with the uh, terms of liter review literature. So the majorly what we saw was in, uh, see, there is only a small portion of protected areas. And with that, the connecting areas is hold either reserve forest or community forest in which the high human activities is being going because you can control the, uh, there are laws, there are people to control the uh, activities of humans inside the protected area, but the community forests, which are also the same, they also serve as a habitat or the home to red pandas. There, the disturbance is at high level. So the main uh, human activities which directly impact or impact more has been classified here. So fire, if we see from this, the firewood collection, we majorly saw through many literature that was the main threat to of the human activities, firewood collection, people go venture into the forest and the red panda being an individual or being a mammal, adaptive to non-disturbed areas get disturbed in the forest with the human activities. Other activities which are directly impacting uh, are harvesting of bamboo. This uh, even I saw in my study area also that uh, people go harvest bamboos and lungs. They make clusters and uh, still the department takes certain actions, but then local people when they need something or their dependency increases in the forest area, these things do happen. And uh, harvesting timber, and TFP collection, cordyceps collection, that is specifically found in cordyceps collection in Sikkim and in Nepal. This is majorly seen. And uh, this uh, collection basically involves uh, people. They venture into the deep forest. They do uh, cutting of the forest so as to in search of the cordyceps to this disturb the habitat of the species. The, if we talk, uh, say, the uh, cattle and livestock on red panda habitat, uh, even through in Singalila National Park, what I witnessed was there is a, a transboundary issue. So the people, there is no settlement from India side of human settlement. There is majorly the SSB uh, base camps and no, but in Nepal side, the people, they do live. They have made many homestays. They are running their business for tourists as it is a tourist hotspot also. So what happens is cattles and their livestock, whatever they rear, they do venture into the forest. They do uh, come across the boundary and they do enter the protected area. So, so the main areas, in, even in the deep forest, I have seen the dung and uh, the dungs of uh, their uh, horses, their cattles also. So the overgrazing, that is being increased in the red panda habitat is a major threat over grazing by the cattle or livestock. And also the clearing of vegetation, farming for farming or for their livestock rearing, they need the feeding for their livestock. They do go into the forest and they do clearing of the forest. If now I talk about the, if we say habit, what are the drivers of habitat fragmentation is habitat fragmentation and also a major threat to the species. There is overgrazing as we have talked earlier in the two slides. And then there is increase in tourism. Tourism has a, like, there have been programs uh, being organized. There have been tourist places, the tourist spots being made. But then still people, when we, go and visit there becomes like a safari to us and we do not like more of a thing that this is uh, according to the conservation of the species or uh, the this is a like very elusive species or the species can get disturbed but the there are other after effects also of the tourism even though it helps in the 
uh, revenue thing and uh, also uh, for the department every month but still increase in tourism has a direct impact uh, on the direct threat on red panda and then the development activities development of highways dams and on the roads uh, also proved to be a major threat to the species now the conservation challenges which the literature have verified from what are the conservation challenges through which the red panda is still suffering and uh, the knowledge or even after the 200 years of descriptions the species is not known the ecological parameters of the species are non known not known completely so there are many challenges like uh, if we say a transboundary issue that is the main issue, issue for now especially uh, what i have seen in north bengal landscape the national park single ila national park shares its boundary one international and national boundary of sikkim also there is high trans boundary issues but majorly in the tourism uh, months tourist months so that and uh, also specifically the climate change that is happening also the weak law enforcement uh, in the area and uh, the lack of awareness in, in the people so now i would like to conclude the in this uh, day with this that there is a high gap in the knowledge with regard to the population behavior dispersal and genetic structure of red panda which adds to conservation challenges and developing management plans as still even after 200 years of this description or it's introduced uh, there is no management plan for a country so our aim which through this project or through the work is basically to prepare a complete monitoring protocol for the species and also as the species is a indicator species for for threats to in old growth forest in the mid and upper himalayan forest and it is found in the area so it is the main indicator and even uh, if i say that despite being an edge species or a evolutionary distinct and globally endangered species with its potential as a flagship species the red panda has uh, not the population of this species continues to decline both globally also and in india also and uh, so this is a high time we realize the importance of this elusive species and also to involve the major steps can be like community involvement and their perception involving people who are like uh, the suitable actions can be taken from the leaders who can take the suitable actions and i would also like to take a major example that is uh, like a very way forward the sorry padmaja naidu himalayan zoological park there has been an augmentation program started by the zoological park that is based specifically based in darjeeling hills they have started this red panda recovery program with an aim to introduce uh, 20 uh, adult in species in both singalila and yoravali national park and uh, north bengal landscape so in 2021 also they have released two red pandas from captive to the uh, wild and in 2000 march 2022 also what i have also witnessed they have made a uh, safe enclosures within the national park and uh, the area is also being they have made, soft enclosures are being made from where they in, they bring out the uh, red pandas from captive or the zoo and uh, then release them in the soft uh, enclosures and after a while when the period is over for around 2 months 2 to 3 months they release they carry out a hard release in the wild and then these red pandas which are being released they are radio collared so the continuous monitoring of them goes on so the this is a very, for a country this is a very uh, first and a very uh, important recovery program especially for red panda and uh, with this i would like to conclude that this is a high time that we speak and we think about the species and its conservation 
and looking forward and looking into the side that it has a very high potential of being a flexible species of the biodiversity area or the habitat in which it is present. So thank you everyone. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so we have a question from Nishant in the chat box. Uh, is there any reading material on red pandas that you can suggest? Okay, so if we talk about the last uh, previous decade, there was no um, such material available. But if we see the studies uh, from the previous decade, there have been a surge of information which is now available. We you can go to various search engines, Google Scholar, and everything to the your specific information uh, regarding even from India also and the other countries also. You can find certain good quality material which is now arising uh, in terms of red panda. Okay, so next, next question is also from Nishant. Can you explain the role of tourism on red panda conservation? See, when we say about tourism and conservation, till the time it is away from the protected areas, it is good. Because when you take tourism as a positive, I don't say tourism uh, is a negative approach. Uh, it has a very positive approach also. But in terms of the species, uh, if I talk positive approach, it's do uh, make aware people of the presence of the species, what other distinct mammal species and other faunal species, avifaunal species are found in the area. But that has a very direct negative impact on the species. What I have seen in the when I was there in the study area around the tourist season, that is high peak of March to April or even till May in Singalila National Park, if people have created such a nuisance, if we say even about the waste they have created near the national park, because that do not have a very high area, only the roads are being, because that has a transboundary area, so only there is one highway, one vehicular road only, that has the access. So that has a direct impact, and uh, but also people do get aware but then it is our responsibility only to take care that also into account when we are uh, touring certain area or a biodiversity hotspot to take care into the account that we do not disturb the animals present in the area. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is from Anupama. Are there any natural predators of red pandas? And also since you mentioned that the released red pandas are being monitored, is there any idea about the survival rate of these pandas? Okay, so by far uh, there have been, so for the second question first, there have been four red pandas that have been released by, through the augmentation program by Padma Naidu Zoo, Zoological Park. So they do monitor uh, the red pandas and also the survival rate uh, is and there is a progressive survival rate for the, uh, the the red pandas that has been released in 2022. They do continuous monitoring. They are still there in Zoological uh, Singalila National Park and uh, they have a uh, from their monitoring. They have a quite success uh, health record also. But uh, when I talk about the earlier two uh, ones, those were released, there is only the last one was being, uh, I think one is there, still there. And the other one, they have got the last record for it. Uh, it's uh, transferring or the movement of the red panda to the Nepal, across Nepal. So after that, there is no record or no monitoring is being able to done because of its movement or certain other thing. And uh, if I say, say, can you please repeat the first question for that? Yes. Uh, so are there any natural predators of the red okay. okay. pandas? Huh. There have been natural predators. Leopard, the presence of leopard is there in the area. Leopard proves to be a natural predator for the adult red pandas. And uh, when we say about the specifically the 
young ones the feral dogs the specifically main one point the natural predation is by the feral dogs that are being increased day by day near the protected areas and also from the stretches they are being in the villages and from there they have started venturing into the forest and they do affect them specifically the young cubs they do predate them so uh, next question is from shakti it's uh, she has three questions so we'll go one by one first is how did you do uh, the identification of individuals by camera trap so identification of individuals is not being done by camera trap camera trap is just a technique to get the occupancy survey uh, in the area we are basically modeling through the presence absence basis just to find out uh, the distribution prime this is a preliminary assessment to uh, like a robust assessment for the whole country our project project is basically based in all the three states we have teams working in all the three states in sikkim arunachal and north bengal and uh, the similar methodology is being taken out because there are still certain areas where the habitat presence is there but there has been no study whether the uh, species is there or no so our uh, camera trapping is just a technique to get the occupancy uh, and to know the, if there is any presence of the species or not so second question is how grazing can impact red pandas and what mitigation can be done so, uh, grazing mm, if i say the red panda is a herbivorous animal they do take rest on the large branches of the big trees Uh, like uh, i can say of sorbus cuspidata which i saw the my very first sighting of red panda in the wild so what happens is when the cattle or the livestock from the nearby villages not i, I won't say the villages because there are no large uh, like uh, settlements they have only small small settlements around the boundary area but they do uh rear cattle and other livestock animals and they when they enter into the forest they do affect the habitat of the area that grazing and uh, being a species that basically depend is dependent on the young shoot or the bamboo shoots they do affect the habitat of the area and in this turn reversely or directly it affects the red panda and if we say about the mitigation measures the proper implementation of the programs like and uh, not enter uh, letting the uh, animals or the cattle or livestock other livestock from taking entry into the forest specifically the protected area can specifically help in uh, like can be a very good part or to minimize at least to a certain level this threat Uh, so next question is how do you identify the male and the female there is no sexual dimorphism in red panda so the identification specifically in the wild is not possible the captive population is being taken into account through the identification as uh, the species do not clearly present any sexual dimorphism mm -hmm. Uh, next question is from Devavani. During your time of study, did you come across any cases of illegal trade regarding red pandas in your study area? As uh, my study was a preliminary survey, I went for the very first survey of mine also. Mm, we do not get into account of any illegal trade in the area. I stayed there uh, for uh, around five months in the field. but till the time i haven't observed any scene of uh, illegal trade or any other criminal offenses in the area of north bengal landscape but then still there have been instances and uh, there are cases reported also from earlier or the years back which i've got the data also from the forest department which is under review but uh, so far when i was there there is no such case being reported next question is from desha have climate change factors affected bamboo enough to have consequences for the close link that red pandas have with the seasonal variation in bamboo uh, for example with protein content in their diet yes climate change if we say that do alter uh, with the bamboo uh, uh, 
so when we say the crude protein that is highly maximum after the monsoon because in monsoon the forage availability increases young shoots appear that are highly in crude but with the climate change and as the females specifically as i told after the monsoon when there is a rearing or of the young ones they primarily depend their diet on the young shoots but when the climate with the climate change the variation in the uh, bamboo shoots appearing and uh, differs that alters that changes the feeding behavior also that uh, hampers with that also so that directly affects and in terms of bamboo specifically but then after post monsoon also they not only uh, they have like they have more uh, they constitute bamboo also but then their diet depends on certain other species also of the plants because they have berries so they eat them from sorbus cuspidata also from aris acaria also so that also constitute in their diet <laughs> Okay. Um, next question is from Smita. Red panda is a flag flagship species. How the species also an umbrella or keystone and indicator species? Can you please repeat the question? I got the fumble with the that. Okay, Let's so. Uh, Smita's question is red panda is a flagship species how is the species also an umbrella or keystone and indicator species okay red panda is a flagship species uh, because that is being used as an ambassador uh, to raise the awareness and the support uh, for the conservation efforts in the area or in that particular habitat which in turn also uh, uh, like affects when we take into account the conservation of the one species if we talk about the habitat improving of the habitat that will in turn naturally be supporting the other biodiversity present in the area maybe floral or faunal so this is the main and uh, for the indicator species if i say as they are basically found in the old growth himalayan forest so they are the main when their presence is there in the forest they are the main indicator that these are the trees or these are the specific uh, species of trees or shrubs which they particularly rely on and this indicate the healthy habitat of the area uh, so this is a follow up on the previous question anupama is asking could you repeat how the grazing pattern affect them since they are arboreal animals okay they are arboreal but for feeding also they are herbivorous the diet no they have modifications to herbivorous diet and uh, when grazing is a see i'll tell you with an example when a cattle or livestock do go into the certain area what do they do they graze over the area and if that habitat if i say is also uh, their habitat also shows the presence of red panda and the cattle are also grazing in the same area so the habitat or the feeding area is being shared of the species and red panda that is highly elusive that basically preferred undisturbed area for its survival even for the feeding even for resting and everything so that eventually get disturbed with the presence of other species in the area continuous uh, grazing and everything and also the vegetation pattern with the high grazing also alters which uh, do because uh, the cattle also basically feed on the young shoots of bamboo and being an arboreal they only live arboreally but then they come down to feed on the uh, species of bamboo which are in shrub stages basically Okay, um, thank you for that. So if anybody else has any other questions, please uh, you can unmute yourself and ask or you can type it in the chat box. We will wait for five more minutes. If not, then we will wrap up with the session.
Shakti is asking, still any projects there? Yes, we have basically just covered the one season data only. We were just there for summer season till, but yes, we got covered till five months till monsoon. But our project is still going. We are still working. We'll be going post monsoon after the monsoon is over back into the field and uh, with a positive approach to get the species and to the more insights on the species. And uh, we will uh, be coming up with a, proto a monitoring protocol, which will be uh, like a standard protocol for the uh, monitoring and uh, conservation approaches of the species uh, throughout the country. Okay. Um, Harshil is asking if uh, they, if he can get your email ID. The email ID uh, is being provided with the organization, your platform also. Ma'am, you can suggest, uh, uh, you can even share or okay. I'll provide in the chat box and uh, okay, sure. if I, yes, you can provide it. Okay, so uh, Shakti is asking, what are the field circumstances? Is it difficult because it's hilly area? If we talk about the circumstances in the field, especially in the monsoon season when I was there, they are quite challenging. But still, when you work in the field, and especially for this highly elusive and beautiful, and uh, yes, one more thing I forgot to share. When the even by the person who described the species called it the most handsome mammal in existence, Mr. Frederick Cuvier. So when you work for the such a handsome species, you get to your gut and uh, you are like getting to inside that this is worth everything, every hard work we are paying off. And uh, specifically, there are certain challenges of working in the hilly areas and. Uh, and more, more, much more are there in the monsoon season. There is no availability of the network. No, because the terrain is such, whatever you have to take and for how many days you are going for the field work inside the forest, you have to carry everything at once only because then you can't come back. You have to have all the resources with yourself. So, but then that comes with the experience of working also. I gained uh, some experience from the mistakes which I've done from the very first time. I'll take that into account from the very next time also, from now. Okay. And from my side, what mistakes would that be? There were certain, because especially in monsoon, the area gets highly, the leeches are there. So you need to get prepared for your body to protect them. Anti-leech guards and everything. And because then that is the time when you'll walk through the forest, even from the twigs of the leaves, the, from the forest, you'll get the leeches biting you, entering into your neck area. And then from your legs, even though we have taken the precaution measures, we took, but then certain, still there were certain. And uh, there were certain mistakes, like we thought we will get the power supply specifically in the single industrial park, but then for 15 days, we were not having any power supply or anything. Because even on the water side, I'm not say, saying deep into the forest, because that is majorly not uh, like supposed to be also. But then on the border side, that is a major tourist hub, specifically the Sandakpur area, that is the highest point of West Bengal. That is the main tourist hub, but then on the Indian side, there is still no power line, no supply. And in monsoon time, there was no, no not even the solar panels were working. So we were stuck there for around 15 days. But then those 15 days were only worth the wait because we got the sighting two times in those days only. So that was worth everything. Wow, that is amazing. Okay, so any other participants, if you have any questions, you can ask now. I think we're done with all the questions. So uh, I'd like to take this moment to give a vote of thanks to our distinguished speaker, Ms. Pooja, ma'am. And before that, I would like to wish all of you a happy International Red Panda Day. And thank you all for joining. So on behalf of the Nature's Eye, I 
uh, it's an honor to give this word of thanks. So thank you so much, Pooja ma'am, for being here with us today, for share, giving us your time and sharing such interesting facts. And uh, like, um, I guess everybody knows more about red pandas now than when we did before joining. So thank you so much for that and for making this such an interesting and insightful session. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the participants also for joining and for your, all your questions and making this uh, such an interactive session. So thank you, everyone. And uh, before we end, I would like to ask if all of you are comfortable, if you can switch on your camera so we could take a screenshot to commemorate this uh, event today. Whoever is comfortable can switch on their cameras. That's fine. Okay, I'll take the picture now. Thank you so much, everyone. And if you all would like to uh, attend such similar events in the future as well, do check out our website. I am uh, posting the link to that in our chat box. So go through that. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to add uh, one thing at the end. Uh, yeah. I am highly thankful for you to giving me the opportunity as this. I'm also a very young one to say all of this. <laughs> and I hope I would have made mistakes throughout the session. But still, when I am also going through the learning process and uh, still, I'll try to get with a positive and much more informative uh, insights if um, I'm being contacted further. Yeah. And through to the audience, thank you for being interactive and patiently bearing to me thank you thank you so much it was really nice to hear you talk about this today oh, happy international okay. panda day to everyone okay so thank you everyone we'll end the session now good night <laughs>